citizens of America. People of the Florida Alliance. And the Western forces of Texas and California will be welcomed back to these United States as soon as their illegal secessionist government is deposed. You don't know what side they're fighting for. All right, just some of what is to come in the new film Civil War being released in theaters today. The movie takes place in an imagined world in the not too distant future with some parallels to what we already see today. A divide amongst citizens, notably in the United States, and constant tensions between those in power and the press. Earlier this week, we sat down with the man behind the film, Alex Garland, whose stories have helped audiences make sense of big trends including the AI one we're living through right now. Alex began his career as a novelist before making his screenwriting debut on 28 Days Later. Since then, he's directed several genre-bending features, including Ex Machina, Annihilation, and Men. Alex is on a press tour promoting Civil War. He stopped by our studio to talk about what inspired the film, how it came together, at what is a tense time for the U.S., so I wrote it four years ago. It's about, I don't know, seven months before January the 6th. But if you cast your mind back to that point, not only was there a lot of anxiety, and there had been for a long time, about polarization and division and populism and extremism and all that kind of thing, something like January the 6th hadn't happened yet exactly, but people were afraid it was going to happen. So. Uh, I remember when January the 6th happened myself feeling kind of uh, kind of disgusted in a sense at, at, the, at where everything had got, but not exactly surprised. Um, uh, and so do you, all you've got to do is remember the conversations that we're having, that, that, that people were having that amongst friends, family, but also uh, in public discourse. In the film itself, you leave a lot open to interpretation, but on the subject specifically of divide yeah. and the divide that we see, and we see it here in Canada, I mean, we see it around the world, quite frankly. You don't have to just look at it through the lens of the United States. Which no, not is, at we, all. Yeah. Although, though I see Canada as being a good more measured than America and my own country and some other European countries or Middle Eastern or Asian or South American, uh, you haven't quite <laughs> On down that road yet, and I, and good move, I would say. I, I guess I, I wonder yeah. the the origins of the divide today, because yeah. you've explored you explored technology a lot. Uh, I I think a lot of people would look at what's happened on social media as one of the key factors. But but how do you think of what has led to the divide that we're seeing now? Social media definitely has a part to play. I also think political opportunism has a part to play. So. Uh, Politicians who, who prioritize being elected uh, more than ideology, in a sense, uh, is definitely something to do with that. Then there's the weakening of the press, the way the press are under attack from without and also from within and contextually, which is also to do with social media. And the press is a check and a balance. Uh, the, one of the questions I asked myself a lot and thought about a lot and where this came from was I thought back to Watergate, Woodward, Bernstein, Washington Post, who brought down a corrupt president with reporting. And I wondered rhetorically, would that happen today? And I was thinking, no, it wouldn't. The press would not have the traction today that they had back then. And what, when you add that problem, because it is a problem, to populism, where does that lead? And it, it, it might also, even if it was seen as something to celebrate in journalism circles today, mm -hmm. someone inevitably would say, well, you're in that camp versus that camp, and we'd be all, all well, over That's the again. question. That, that is the question. What camp is that? Um, I would say that's a centrist camp. The camp I'm describing is a centrist camp. Uh, Centrism is sort of funny, kind of dirty word almost, but it, it precludes camps of a certain sort. I have a political position. I have friends who have a different political position. Weirdly, in my world view of politics, I'm left of center. I would not want 
my government to be in power indefinitely in a centrist position, you actually seek for there to be a strong opposition and sometimes them to be in power because that is its own form of check and balance. And that, that's the way I see the world. The, 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 so sides get eroded to an extent in that way of looking. The side is centrism versus extremism. That's, that's, that's my side. I'm a centrist. I do not like extremism because I think it uh, leads to serious trouble. And what about physical location? Because in the film, you explore the idea of states that have separated. Yeah. Uh, we had our own bout with separatism with Quebec. But it is interesting, you know, you, we're at a point and you've explored big technological themes. You have operators of big tech platforms that are leaders themselves, but in, in some cases, um, they end up in states with strong message. I mean, Texas itself has a very strong message of what it represents in today's America. So does California. Yeah. yeah, yeah. One thing I'm interested in is not so much where California and Texas are different, but where they're similar. In the film, to deliberately get in the way of a certain kind of easy reading of the film, in part, Texas and California have joined forces they're joining forces against a fascist president, a president who has dismantled as aspects of the constitution, aspects of the legal system, is attacking journalists in a certain kind of way. And what they've said is our political differences are less important than this issue, which is fascism. Um, uh, that would then go back to what I was saying before. The interesting thing is, what, for me personally, is where I see fascism creeping in where I see the fingerprints of it occurring and, uh, and then how much of a danger is it? What, one, of the, one of the things I think about fascism is that a lot of people who are fascistic don't actually see themselves as fascists because they know it's a bad word and it's got a kind of stigma to it. But actually in their behavior, there is something distinctly fascistic. And anyway, th those, those are the... The, uh, those are the dividing lines I'm interested in. It's interesting to hear you say that as well because we cover business and we cover the markets yeah. and a portion of that is assessing the world, the taking the geopolitical temperature and quite literally people trying to determine what direction an individual might be leaning in terms of how they lead a government or what, what ultimately that means. How much does that become a consideration when you're putting the script together, when you're putting the film together, the, the economic ramifications or the, the, the economic considerations that, that lead to, you know, in this case, civil war? Economics is politics. So, so do I think about it? Yes, I do. Uh, where does, where is the success of populism? It's partly in people who've been kept poor for generation after generation after generation, trickle down economics, just not functioning, uh, wealth essentially being hoarded, people feeling trapped and feeling that they need something to break the system because the system is breaking them. So that, that is economics and it's also politics. Yeah. In terms of the film, honestly, I take a whole lot of money to make a film of someone. It's a transaction, right? I don't take it personally, the film takes it. I try and put all the money on the screen. And, uh, and then I feel an obligation to pay it back, which is why I'm talking to you. Because I'm trying to sell the film, yeah. right? I'm trying to sell it. Uh, because the distributor's taken a risk and I feel like it's my job in part to mitigate or limit that risk. Well, certainly they're, they're, they're making that bet on you because I know. Uh, they're crazy. <laughs> no, no pressure, but obviously it's been <laughs> successful. But I think, uh, you know, it's, it's funny, uh, currency comes up in the film as well, actually. Yeah. Canadian currency, what, yeah. what, what was the thought there? Oh, it's just a joke. <laughs> it's just a gag, cheap <laughs> gag. That, that's these people go into a petrol station and try and buy something for $300 and they say, oh, I'll get you a sandwich. And then they say, no, no, it's Canadian dollars. And he goes, all right, what do you need? <laughs> because the currency here is clearly more powerful. We're watching that closely. Just a final question. Uh, one of the interesting things, your, um, your scripts, your films, they're all based on, in, in a lot of ways, where we are at this moment. Like everything that has led to this moment, the world that you've grown up in and trying to make sense of that. But interestingly, you've helped to paint a picture of where the world could be going with a lot of your... Uh, films, you know, even with Ex Machina, a lot of people now looking at 
that film and trying to figure out when, you know, you've got companies like Tesla that are building robots for the future. Uh, did you ever anticipate that, the, the, the idea that in a trend-based world where everyone is desperate to figure out where we're going? Do you know, part of it, just to say, was the way uh, very sophisticated AI systems require data and where the data is harvested from, which is us. Um, uh, did I think about that? Yes. I just feel slightly uncomfortable with the idea that it's prescient just because at the time I made it, it's a big topic of conversation with a lot of people. And really what I'm doing is, is plugging into something other people are stating, which I find interesting. I, I don't want to paint myself as more dignified than that. I'm, I'm uh, holding on to coattails.